how Aston Martin was made. How did the luxurious car brand we know today as Aston Martin climb to the top? When some people hear the name Aston Martin, they think of one of the numerous high-performance vehicles that are only found in racing games. That's not wrong, but that's not right either. For many others, the James Bond movie series comes to mind. That is also not wrong. The James Bond movie franchise adopted the Aston Martin for its use to the present day. But for true believers, a specific image of a vehicle comes to mind. A low-slung, uniquely shaped exotic of British origin that gives an exciting sound when in action. But who makes these cars? And whose dream was it to make us fall in love with a car company that makes vehicles that are as beautifully handmade and uniquely named? Here in this video, you will learn the history of the Aston Martin car brand and how it came to be much loved by many and affordable for few. Here is the interesting and sometimes twisted story of how Aston Martin was made. Let's get started from the very beginning of how Aston Martin came to be. Globally, no brand has come to and remained in the limelight without a story connecting the brand's current position to its origin. But if there's one brand with a seemingly rich and quite humble beginning, it is Aston Martin. Like many other car brands, Aston Martin was an idea, birthed by Lionel Martin, who paired with Robert Bamford. It was a simple but creative idea that they probably didn't contemplate at the time would blossom into the very success that it is today. Surprisingly, they met in a bicycle club after Lionel Martin had a two-year driving ban for failing to pay a driving fine in 1909. It's hilarious that these two car brand co-founders had a love for bicycles, which brought them together. But before we go further, let us say a few things about each co-founder before they met at the Bath Road Club. Lionel Martin. Before meeting at the bicycle club, Lionel Martin was an avid member of numerous bicycle clubs, such as the Oxford University Bicycle Club and the Bath Road Club. While belonging to the Bath Road Club, he met a gentleman named Monahue Rapier, interested in selling cars. By 1901, they became partners, and as life would have it, they eventually did many amazing things together. Lionel Martin's love for bicycles, and the driving ban, also led him to spend more time riding his bicycle. Growing up, his parents could testify about his love for bicycles, and there are claims they tried all they could to divert his interest because it affected his concentration on other things like his studies. While his parents were not completely against his love for bicycles and the time and efforts he put into driving them, they were also interested in ensuring he had a thriving academic career. However, it appeared like Lionel Martin already had his mind fixated on what he wanted to do, ride bicycles as fast as he could. Interestingly, it wasn't just something that interested him alone, but also something that he put a lot of effort into, practicing night and day. This made him gain the fastest time for a rider between York and Edinburgh in 1911. This is when he first met future Aston Martin partner, Robert Bamford. Lionel Martin undoubtedly was an amazing and swift cyclist, but what about Robert Bamford? What about this man correlated with Lionel Martin's interests that made him go into a partnership? Robert Bamford. Robert Bamford was the first child of Reverend Bamford and Edith Bamford. Robert Jr. served in the First World War in a cyclist battalion. An engineer with much love for moving things, he would become the lead engineer for Bamford and Martin Limited, the company that would later become Aston Martin. He also belonged to the Bath Road Club, where he would meet co-founder Lionel Martin. This was the beginning of a beautiful, albeit short, relationship. This relationship may be one that many didn't anticipate, but the results it produced are not so surprising. For years, those around Robert Bamford found him as someone who was diligent in his abilities and productive in his deliveries. He was not known to be that type of person who gave up easily. Before his relationship and eventual partnership with Lionel Martin, he tried his hand on several other things that produced amazing results. While those things are worthy of note, it's important that we stick to Aston Martin. One very important setup that created the foundation for Aston Martin is Bamford and Martin Limited. Bamford and Martin Limited. Bamford and Martin came together to form Bamford and Martin Limited in 1913, although these two had been together since 1912. 
They had planned to sell cars made by Singer, with Hanker Muse being their first location. The question to ask here is how did they move from their love for cycling to getting, driving, and selling vehicles? Yes, they loved cycling and had several races to determine who was faster between them. However, they decided to try a vehicle race and that was a fun experience. Then there was another car race and several others followed until they decided to start monetizing their interests. For starters, they spent time working on different cars to understand how they worked. This was not an easy period for them because they had put in a lot of effort working on these vehicles. While in their humble beginnings, they also repaired and serviced different car brands that came their way. Lionel Martin was a good engineer and a better driver, and in his free time, he raced at different places. Bamford was also very good, but no matter how well he tried, he always found Martin outshining him. The more he tried and wasn't getting the win, the more he wanted to try. After one of these races, the two engineers conceived of their ideas of designing vehicles they felt would be great for racing. It sounded like a weird idea, but it was something they were both cool with and believed they could transform into an amazing venture. They sat down and drew a plan of how they were going to achieve it and the possible means of launching the project. Martin was more instrumental in making the first ever vehicle called Aston Martin as he decided to attach a well-designed engine with four cylinders to the chassis. The logo, resembling a car radiator we have come to fall in love with and associate with the car brand, was created here and added to the cars. Mass production was halted due to World War I, and both founders decided to put everything on hold to go help their country. All of their machinery and equipment were sold to the aviation company Sopwith. For someone who had little understanding about the brand or the brains behind it, you might think that was the end of Austin Martin. There are also those who don't know that the brand existed before the World War and only had to pack up because of a mutual decision of the founders. World War I was an incident that one would never want to repeat because many lives were lost. Thankfully, Aston and Bamford held their heads high and came out victorious and presented their brand in an entirely new fashion to the world. So what happened after the war, and what changes did the brand make to achieve its aims? Post-World War I After the First World War, the pair came back together and wasted no time designing a new vehicle in months. Due to reasons unknown, the company moved to Abington Road, also in Kensington and here they continued to work. Banfield left the company five years later, and Count Louis Zaborski decided to take up the financing. The reason for Banfield leaving the company wasn't clear, as there are several reports suggesting that he had a falling out with his partner. While the departure of Bamford was a major blow for the company, the company wasted no time charting a new course and moving forward with production and sales of the cars. By 1922, the company delivered quality and fast vehicles to race in the French Grand Prix. This resulted in setting multiple endurance and world speed records with designs named the Green P, the Halford Special, and the Razor Blade. This generated some publicity for the company, which was still named Bamford & Martin at the time. They declared bankruptcy in 1924 and were bought by Lady Charnwood. With Lady Charnwood's son John at the helm, the company went bankrupt yet again the following year, and the factory at Abington Road had to be closed. At the time, Martin was no longer a director with Banford & Martin Limited. He was engaged with Singleton Birch, a minerals company owned by a rich family. Rumor has it that after 1925, Martin never owned an Aston Martin. So two friends were interested in cycling, which metamorphosed into car racing and a desire to make and sell cars. They started an amazing idea that would later become the highlight of their career, survived a World War scare, negotiated the bend, and got running again. Then there was a falling out. One left the company, the other left his directorship, and the company went bankrupt. Here ends the story for both co-founders, or so we think. Interestingly, this story still has a few more chapters. Lady Charnwood, alongside other investors, Bill Renwick and Augustus Bertelli, decided to give the company another chance. They renamed the company Aston Martin Motors and moved the factory to Feltham. Renwick and Bertelli had a good experience in engine design and even had a patented four-engine design available. They hoisted it on a chassis and called it a buzzbox, which has now become a trademark inclusion in several of their models. It is the only car that this pair would ever make under Aston Martin Motors, and the design is still on display today as it speaks volumes about the history of the popular Aston Martin brand. 
It took a while for the pair to figure out that they could create a new car and sell it under the Aston Martin Motors company. However, when they figured it out, they wasted no time. Bertelli began to design and sell with the company name. And in 1926, Aston Martins began to flood the market in numbers. Individuals within and outside the state began placing orders to purchase these cars. Many of these cars were also used to race and became known for their superb motoring and efficiency. But once again, the company faced financial issues and a bevy of ownership transitions. From Lance Prideau Brune, it went to Sir Arthur Sutherland. Undoubtedly, these changes in ownership had a lot of impact on the company and its operations. These lean times caused the company to focus fully on road cars only, but World War II caused another pause. Now at this point, you must be wondering why there always has to be a pause during world wars. And you may be asking, is it normal? Or is it something that's unique to this brand? Wars affect many things, and especially the movement of people. It's also a great risk from a financial point of view to run a business during a major crisis like a world war. It is, however, important to note that the company didn't completely halt production of cars. Instead, it shifted its operations and started manufacturing aircraft components for the Allies to survive the times and support the war. David Brown Nine years later, in 1947, David Brown Limited, a private machine tools manufacturer based in Huddersfield, purchased Aston Martin Motors and put it under its Tractor Group subdivision, along with Lagonda. This would prove momentous, as this formed the name that we know to date. Also, David Brown would form the initials every Aston Martin car would bear from now on. The period after this was a long and productive one, and between 1950 and 1972, Aston Martin established its pedigree for a long line of iconic racing cars. Tadek Merrick was instrumental in the design of the engines which guaranteed maximum performance and protection for users. Again, Aston Martin ran into difficulties which resulted from poor financial decisions and the lack of a detailed and strategic marketing plan. David Brown decided to exit, and company development owned by William Wilson took the reins. Many issues broke out during his reign. Recession, lack of capital, and a stop to Aston Martin sales in the United States due to an inability to meet emission requirements, which was the final straw that broke the camel's back. Once again, Aston Martin's factory was closed, and over 400 workers were laid off. By this point, it seems like every time a crisis is solved, another one appears for the beleaguered company. When this happens, the old owners are forced to leave and new ones will emerge, so it wasn't surprising to see yet another round of new ownership for the company. The next ownership group was comprised of Peter Sprague, George Minden, Jeremy Turner, Alan Curtis, and George Flather. Sprague was the head, and he allowed the business to maintain its British roots. They renamed the business Aston Martin Lagonda Limited, and soon things were getting better. In 1976, different companies ordered over 300 cars from Aston Martin. Led by William Towns, the company released some iconic cars that same year, and even more in successive years, including the V8 Vantage, the Volante, the Lagonda, and the Bulldog. In 1980, just after the release of the Bulldog design, Sprague and Alan Curtis opted to sell, citing that they were never looking to go long-term with the company. Victor Gauntlet became the next owner, along with Tim Harley. At a time when Aston Martin was not so desired, this pair took the brand into new markets and economies and had successes there. Due to their success and growing status, the Prince of Wales granted Aston Martin Lagonda a royal warrant of appointment. This meant that they would supply cars to the Prince of Wales. James Bond Next comes the association with the James Bond franchise. Gauntlet, who would let go much of his hold on the company, was pivotal in this process and, at a point, even offered his vantage for one of the movies. We might never know if Gauntlet had foreknowledge, but this move sparked a rise in sales. This established the company's presence in the world car market for many years, even to this day. In 1987, Ford saw potential in Aston Martin and decided to purchase some of it to work with the existing model drawn by the initial founders. Because of Ford's experience in the auto market, it was easy for Aston Martin Lagonda to scale up quickly. The effect was massive. By 2002, the company had produced its 6,000th car. And that same year, they replaced the DB7 with the DB9 and started producing the Vanquish. In 2007, businessman David Richards bought the company for £475 million. But Ford was not ready to let go completely, 
and so they maintained a 40 million pound stake. Aston Martin decided to push and expand into new markets even further. This culminated in two Britons taking the V8 Vantage for a long drive from Tokyo to Istanbul before joining the route back to London. This was a success as Aston Martin dealerships popped up in China less than three months after the long drive. Maybe you could take your prototypes for a spin next time, eh? Mercedes entered the picture in 2013 when Daimler AG signed a contract with Aston Martin. The contract implied that the next generation of Aston Martin vehicles would be fitted with engines made by Mercedes AMG and that Daimler AG would have a 5% stock in Aston Martin. Not sure what this exactly meant, but we all know who is helping out and who is being helped out. The DB11 is the first car in this series, and we know there's more to come. So here is Aston Martin Laganda Global Holdings PLC, a dream of two men who died just years after they started in Kensington and wound up holding a large part of the luxury car market. While its history has so much to cry and laugh about at the same time, one thing's for sure, they are one of the biggest luxury car brands in operation today. If you see one drive past you, honor the young men who started it, but were not given a chance to do much more.